A little over a year ago, I made my first ever Science Explained video, and it was on back training. Since then, I've updated my opinion on some things, and I'd like to improve and expand on that information. So before we get into the best training techniques for the back, let's cover some basic anatomy first. For our purposes here, we're gonna split the back up into four main muscles. The latissimus dorsi, or lats, the trapezius, the rhomboids, and the erector spinae, or spinal erectors. The lats contribute mostly to the appearance of back width, they have two main functions, which are to adduct the arm, or basically bring the arm in closer to the body when it's out to the side, and to extend the arm, or basically bring the arm in closer to the body when it's out in front. So to hit the lats most optimally, we should be performing exercises that train shoulder adduction and exercises that train shoulder extension. The traps contribute mostly to the appearance of back thickness, and while their individual functions are highly varied, the upper traps mainly function to elevate the scapula, like in a shrug, while the mid and lower traps primarily retract the scapula, like in a row. The rhomboids are split into a rhomboid major and rhomboid minor, but both have the same main function, which is scapular retraction. So for the most part, these muscles will be targeted with the same basic exercises that hit the mid traps. The spinal erectors of the lower back extend all the way up the spine to the skull and function to extend the entire vertebral column. So let's start with the lats. I found that similar to the glutes, many trainees have a tough time feeling their lats working, and this is because their biceps or traps can take over. And performing a lat pre-activation movement, like one-arm lat pull-ins or cable pullovers, is helpful to engage a mind-muscle connection and get blood flowing to the appropriate muscles. And this has been supported by a growing body of research, including a 2009 study in which Snyder and Leach showed that specific coaching cues, such as palpation of the lats and thinking about engaging the lats, was able to increase their EMG activation during a lat pulldown. Here, my favorite cues are to think about pulling in a straight line that would split the body into a front and a back half to laterally crunch into the direction of the pull, and similar to in the study, palpate the lat muscle and feel the contraction as it happens. For the cable pullover, I like to lean slightly forward, drive my elbows down, not back, and tuck my elbows in tight to my sides. These are intended to be light sets, not taken to failure, with a focus on slow and controlled reps with mindful contractions. After two to three sets of pre-activation, it's time to get into the training proper. Now to make this more applicable, in coaching circles, generally back movements are split into two categories, vertical pulls and horizontal pulls. We'll cover vertical pulls first. And our main two options here are the pull up and the lat pull down. And while a lot of people put the pull up on a pedestal, a 2013 study from Doma and colleagues showed no difference in lat activation between the pull up and pull down with equal relative loading. One notable difference was that the biceps were more active in the pull up, implying that if you're trying to get some indirect bicep work in, the pull up might be your better option. But if you're trying to isolate the lats and reduce biceps involvement, then the lat pulldown could be better. Overall, these are very comparable movements for hypertrophic purposes in my eyes. So what about grip and hand position? Well, first, there doesn't seem to be a big difference between pulldowns to the front and to the back of the neck, as three studies independently showed no difference in activation. However, one 2002 paper did show pulldowns to the front to have a slight edge. And since this style of pulldown puts the shoulder in a less vulnerable position and generally allows for the use of heavier loads, this is the technique I recommend. While the differences were small, a 2014 paper from Anderson and colleagues supports the use of a medium grip, defined as 1.5 times shoulder width, over both a narrow, or shoulder width, and wide grip at two times shoulder width. And they based this recommendation on the observation that there was a trend for higher activation during the eccentric phase for not just the lats, but also for the traps and infraspinatus, and that generally heavier loads could be used with this in-between grip. And finally, a 2010 paper out of Pennsylvania State University found that lat activation was higher with a pronated, or overhand grip, than with a supinated, or underhand grip. The V-bar attachment is a personal favorite of mine, and I do like to include it periodically since it allows the lats to be trained through shoulder extension with a vertical pull. And this is despite the fact that Signoral and colleagues found the pronated grip to yield greater lat activity than the neutral grip. But taken together, I think if really looking to optimize your technique on lat pulldowns, pulling to the front of the neck with a medium pronated grip is likely to maximize lat recruitment. Granted, these findings are based on averages, and if you feel one variation working your lats better than the others, you may want to go with that instead. So what about horizontal pulls? Most people seem to believe that vertical pulls hit the lats and as such develop back width, while horizontal pulls hit the traps and rhomboids, developing back thickness. But this isn't really true, since research indicates that rows yield the same or perhaps even greater lat activity than lat pulldowns, and with even more trap involvement. So to get the best bang for your buck, a row is a must to be included in your routine for 
both thickness and width. A chest supported T-bar row has been a staple in my own training because it allows for more lower back support than a freestanding row. One 2009 study found that the inverted row was better than the bent over barbell row at activating the lats. And an earlier 2005 study showed that the seated cable row was better than the bent over barbell row. Taken together, these studies might indicate that lat activity is greater with exercises that don't involve stabilizing the lower back. Granted, the bent over barbell row is a classic movement for overall back development, and it will thicken up the erectors in a way that chest supported rows simply can't on their own. For rows, I think periodically using a variety of grip positions makes sense, and given the lack of activation data for grip positions on rows, I would use a grip that feels most comfortable to you, or vary your grip periodically for a variety. Borrowing from the lat pull down research, I think a slightly wider than shoulder width double overhand grip is best, and in my coaching experience, doesn't run the same risk as a double underhand grip for biceps injury. Dumbbell rows are nice because they allow both sides to be worked evenly, which can be helpful in preventing or fixing asymmetries. But one limitation with the dumbbells is that your overloading potential will be limited to the heaviest dumbbells in your gym. The rope face pull is another tried and true exercise for rear delt and trap development. In my own training, I like to do this exercise two different ways. One can be thought of as a high row, where you pull the rope to your eyes and squeeze your shoulder blades together on each rep. And this is meant to target the mid traps and rear delts. The other way is performed using external rotation and scapular elevation. And this is meant to target more of the muscles of the rotator cuff, as well as the rear and side delts. And while it's great for shoulder and postural health, it won't beef up your traps much. So what about the upper traps? Well, I'd recommend watching my neck and trap science explained video for a full breakdown on that. But very quickly, I think that doing barbell shrugs with a slightly wider grip is better for maximizing upper trap recruitment since a landmark 1994 study found that because of the orientation of the upper trap fibers, they can't effectively elevate the scapula when the arm is in neutral. However, this wider grip can be more awkward to do for some, and it will limit the weight you can use. So if doing heavy power shrugs using leg drive and momentum, you can use a closer grip, and when doing higher rep strict shrugs, use a slightly wider grip. Deadlifts from the floor will train the traps and shoulder stabilizers isometrically, and they're great for building a muscular lower back, but because they involve so much leg musculature, I consider deadlifts to be a lower body exercise. To make it more trap focused, you can perform rack pulls or block pulls to reduce the range of motion and maximize the load placed on the erectors and the traps. Now, since any program with squats and deadlifts will recruit the spinal erectors to a very large degree, I don't think isolation work here is required. However, if you're unable or unwilling to perform these compound movements, adding in a weighted lower back extension is a good idea. In terms of fiber type, both the lats and the traps appear to be predominantly type two or fast twitch dominant, implying they may respond better to heavier loads, while the spinal erectors are more type one dominant, implying they may respond better to lighter loads. And granted, I still think using a variety of rep ranges for every muscle group is best for maximizing overall development. Specific volume and frequency recommendations will be individual and are made in my back hypertrophy program, but a training frequency of two to three times per week is likely to optimize development for most. And if your back is a glaring weak point on your physique, you can prioritize it by training it early in the week after a rest day and spaced apart from your leg days by at least 48 hours to ensure total body recovery. Adding in three to four quick sets of wide grip pull-ups on non-training back days, such as at the end of a leg workout, is another effective strategy I've used to help increase total weekly volume. And while, generally speaking, the back can handle a pretty high workload, be careful when handling volumes higher than 25 working sets per week for the back, since, according to Dr. Mike Isertel, that is when most trainees start running into recovery issues. And I hope that with these new scientific principles in mind, you make the most of your back training in the new year and beyond. All right, hey, what is going on, everyone? Uh, first of all, just wanna say thank you for watching the video. I hope all of you guys had a very Merry Christmas just out here now uh, for a little walk. And I don't know if you can see, but it snowed so much here in Kelowna the last couple days. But yeah, I just wanna say thank you guys for watching the video. I have two quick, important announcements, um, so don't click out of the video just yet. First is I'd like to thank Squarespace for sponsoring this video. Squarespace is an all-in-one creator website platform, and they allow you to custom create your own website. They have beautiful designer custom templates and 24-7 customer service. So if you'd like to get started on your own website or building your own online store, uh, you can go to squarespace.com forward slash nippered. And if you use the offer code nippered, at checkout, that'll save you 10% off your first purchase. Second, I've finally released my back hypertrophy program. I know a lot of you guys have been asking me about this one. So it's now finally available on my website. Like most of my programs, I like to think of this more so as a training manual than just a program. Um, so it includes all of the scientific information to do with anatomy and exercise science included in this video, plus some additional stuff, uh, especially to do with periodization and programming that I wasn't able to get into in the video. So this is an eight week training program plus a one week deload. And the back is hit three times per week. Uh, so two of those are pretty high volume workouts and one is 
more or less a mini supplemental workout. And there are over 20 exercises included in the training program. So there's a ton of variety, including some exercises that I don't think I've really ever shown on the channel uh, or I haven't really seen anywhere else. So if you guys would like to check it out, it'll be at the first link in the description box below. And I'm gonna be selling it for $19.99 for the first week of launch. And then after that, it's gonna go up to $29.99. So make sure you grab it while it's still on sale. If you guys are looking to take your back muscular development to the next level uh, in the new year, I'd recommend checking out this program. And I just wanna thank you guys so much for watching the video. I have so much new content planned for 2018 and I'm really excited to get started on it. Leave me a like if you liked it. Don't forget to subscribe and I will see you guys in the next one.